Good morning, Astronomy 1020. Getting a slightly late start today, but we are starting and there are things for us to do. Let's see here. Um, today, we're gonna continue learning about miscellaneous facts about stars. I wanna uh, talk a little bit more about binary stars and uh, look at the HR diagram with you guys, get you thinking about uh, the different aspects of stellar masses and sizes and then uh, I want to transition to talking about how stars form from the interstellar medium. And uh, this is a subject that actually can be pretty interesting, so I, I hope you will enjoy it. Uh, we're going to do a homework today on chapter 16. I think it's homework number eight. There's some tough problems in that chapter, so hang on to your hats. We're going for a little ride today, okay? <laughs> um, I know, I know. It's not the best day for me either, but... We'll take it slow, we'll make it fun if we can make it fun. So um, do you guys remember your three types of, actually, no, that's not how I wanna start this. Let's start by looking at the HR diagram. Let's look at a cartoon of the HR diagram. Um, in chapter 15, we spent some time building our way up to talking about what is one of the most important graphs in all of astronomy. And this is a kind of cartoon made for kids version of it um, that's designed, uh, I just totally forgot what that slide was, 45, it's somewhere around here. Uh, this is a made for kids version, oops, excuse me, which shows you a handful of famous stars splayed on a, out on a graph where, let me get my annotate tool here, and let's pick dazzling red. Remember that we actually, I wanna pick blue for reasons that will become obvious. We plot temperature on the x-axis and weirdly temperature increases towards the left, which is a little bit different than you normally do it in a graph. The luminosity of a star increases vertically. The radius of a star grows from diagonal left to diagonal right so Betelgeuse is one of the biggest stars in the nighttime sky, largest in radius. And mass is the most confusing of all of them. I want to say something very simple, that mass increases diagonally to the left. That would be true as long as I was talking about this region here. Do you guys remember what this line is called? I know you learned it at the end of class, so you might have been sort of checked out. Main sequence. Yes, the main sequence. The main sequence is a big deal, and I'm going to be talking a lot about it. You have to understand that people experimentally determined this graph. They were trying to plot different quantities of stars that they could measure to sort of learn something about them. Remember, friends, that most, actually all stars are basically just microscopic dots of light. They are unresolved point sources. We can't see any of their features. We can't see any detail or structure. They're just microscopic dots. We can take their spectrum and look at the absorption lines, but that's kind of about it. In fact, I think there's only one star besides the sun that's ever been imaged or resolved. And to help you understand the, the problem that we're up against, I wanna show you that picture. Because Betelgeuse is such a large star in radius, and because it's relatively close at 600 light years away, Betelgeuse uh, pretty much remains the only star that we've ever had any luck uh, imaging as more than a point source. And this is pretty much the best photo of Betelgeuse we have. What's my point? This photo sucks, bro. You can't see anything on it. It's barely even resolved. Now, yes, you are seeing this thing as a disc, okay? That is definitely the bottom of Betelgeuse, and that's definitely the top of Betelgeuse. But notice that the photo is so blurry that we can't make out any fine details. And this is the only star we have a picture of besides the sun. So we're desperate. If, if we want to know about space, if we're curious about nature and the universe, and we want to know what's up with the stars and the galaxies and how does all this thing work, then we've got to do whatever crazy thing we got to do to learn about the properties of stars. 
That's where the HR diagram comes in. The HR diagram lets us plot some measurable quantities and learn some facts, some details about stars that help us understand how they work. We can measure the spectrum of a star. And if you remember the story of the Harvard computers, that allows us to measure their temperature. The luminosity is a little more tricky. For luminosities, you'd actually have to know how much light the star was putting out. But you do know that for some nearby stars because you can measure their distances with parallax. Maybe, maybe we should try this from a different way. Let's take a couple of notes about how we find stars out in our galaxy. Um, believe it or not, half of the stars that you see in the nighttime sky are not single individual stars, but roughly 50% of all stars are binaries. Let's, uh, let's put that down as a note. 50% of all stars are binaries. In fact, there's a lame ass astronomy joke that goes like this, three out of every two stars is a binary. That's the lame joke astronomers tell each other all the time. That means if we ask the question, how are stars found or how are they organized in our galaxy, the answer would be that you find them in one or two different configurations. There are uh, single stars. Oh, I got to tell you something. Um, I don't know if I told you the story yet, but a couple of semesters ago, I had these twins in my summer class and they were really awesome. And I would talk to them after class about twin life and what it was like being a twin. And they told me, oh, you're the singletons. Yes, Blair, that's right. They said that we, they felt bad for people who are not twins and that we were singletons. So this is my, thank you, Blair, for reminding me that I was about to do an old man thing and tell a story twice. Um, we have singletons. All right. Sometimes people just call them field stars, just random single stars. We also find binaries. Remember that a binary is when you have two stars that are gravitationally bound to each other. You have to have gravity binding you in some kind of an orbit, okay? Um, we also find stars in clusters. Oh, by the way, there are binaries, there are even uh, trinary stars. Uh, our nearest neighbor, Alpha Centauri, turns out to have two stars that are about the same mass and radius as the sun. They're called uh, Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B but there's actually a third star in the system called Proxima Centauri. And what's cool about Proxima Centauri, Proxima Centauri is a little dirtbag star that kind of orbits on a wide orbit around the two. So our nearest neighbor is actually uh, a trinary star. You wouldn't know, uh, by the way, um, yes, well, okay, here's the deal, Blair. That's a cool question. The trick is, can they survive in a stable orbit? What weirdly happens in most trinary star systems is unless you have like two stars that are close and one that's orbiting around, if three stars are kind of comparable in size or mass, the orbital dynamics of three stars actually usually cause one of the members to get flung out or ejected. This is known in astrophysics as the three body problem. And it's kind of a whole damn thing. What's more ironic, Blair, is that rather than having three or four stars, we also find stars in clusters. Ironically, if you just pig pile a shitload of stars on top of each other, some of them get flung out, but you manage to make a stable structure. And these are called stellar clusters. And I want to tell you about them because they're beautiful. Okay. So let's talk about um, star clusters. I'm going to show you examples of all of this stuff in a second. 
there's all this this uh, these chapters will have lots of opportunities for cool astro photos, and I love showing students that. Um, there are two types of star clusters, and I want you to know about them because if you ever get to come to a telescope with me, I'm going to show them to you. Um, there are these clusters called open clusters, and open clusters uh, are usually a loose association of maybe 50 to 100 stars. So there's 50 to 100 stars. Um, they're quite beautiful to look at. Usually these stars are blue, young, and extremely luminous. And then there's another type of stellar cluster called globular clusters. Globular clusters are the complete opposite. First of all, first of all they tend to have something like hundreds of thousands of stars in them. So it's a true, they're almost like mini galaxies. And the thing about globular clusters is they're not made of bright blue, young luminous stars. They are made of um, red, old, and dim stars. So take those notes down. And then it's time for me to do a little show and tell with you guys while I sip some iced tea here. Are there only three people in the class today? Or is everyone trolling? Is that what's going on? Don't I have any friends? Okay, thank you, Christopher. It's nice to see some humans on the other side of the Zoom here. Okay. <clears throat> thank you, Emily. What's up? How the birds? Very loud. <laughs> they are loud. I love it. <laughs> All right, we keep we keep them uh, in the mix every now and then. Um, <clears throat> we got some chats coming your way. Okay, let me show you some cool pics. Um, I want to show you first a picture of Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri. I can spell today. What I want to show you guys, the one that I think is interesting, is the picture of Alpha Centauri A and B and Proxima Centauri. You'd never even notice it. Okay. So this is kind of illuminates one of the issues in astronomy. Our closest neighbor, we actually can't see Alpha Centauri from the northern hemisphere. So if you came to a telescope with me, I couldn't be like, oh, there it is. We'd have to be in Venezuela. But notice in order to get a good picture of them, they've taken such a long exposure photograph that you can see crap loads of stars in the background. Here's Alpha Centauri A and B. Look at this. Do you see that little crappy dim red star there? That is Proxima Centauri. If you looked at this image and someone had not circled it for you, you would never know that Proxima Centauri was somehow connected or even close to these two stars. And this is one of the issues with stars. Sometimes they're stacked up against each other in a line of sight. Like in this case, my blue marker and my red marker are not near each other, but you guys are seeing them through my camera close to each other. This is what we call in astronomy an optical double. They look like they're connected or they're close to each other, but in fact, they're far away. Now, um, how far apart are the stars, Cameron? Uh, well, how far apart are what? I'm not, I'm not, you have to be more uh, specific there. I want to answer that question. Uh, I, I think Alpha Centauri are separated. Jeez, I actually don't remember. I know that Proxima Centauri is like several light, is like almost a light year from the other two stars. Sometimes, pro technically speaking, right now, Proxima Centauri is closer to Earth because it's, it's in a part of its orbit where it's a little closer to Earth. Uh, yeah, I know that Proxima is like s stupid far away. It's like, like almost a light year or something. Uh, it probably mentions it here. Well, Proxima Centauri. Uh, it says something like 13,000 astronomical units. Sorry. 
the Escape from Space Station Andromeda. What do they have a they have a science a astronomy themed escape room? Holy cow! Hey, can I tell you something? One of my friends dragged me to one of those escape rooms once, and you paid like twenty bucks. It was actually really cool. There were all these like mind puzzles to solve, and there was like cryptography and stuff. It is fun, yeah. And normally I'm I poo poo things like that, but I I actually had a blast. So if there's an Andromeda Galaxy themed escape room. And that's probably like one block from my house. Then I, yes, I am obliged to go there. Okay. Oh, you're a pro at those, huh, Blair? Okay. Well, we'll be we'll be counting on your help. We can talk about it. Anyways, um, I want to show you guys some pictures of star clusters. Okay. So now that I've showed you a binary star, um, two of the most famous star clusters. These are both examples of open clusters. Um, are the Pleiades and the Hyades open cluster. Now you got to feel me out on this. When I take people to the telescope, um, I'll, I'll let them look through the telescope and I'll show them a cluster of stars. And when you look through the field of view, at first you may not fully get the whole thing. You might be thinking, huh, okay, so I'm looking at some stars. What's the significance of this? And then you start to realize that they're just really beautiful. Seeing star clusters, they're like sparkling gems or something. There's it, it, it's it's like something you can just learn to enjoy um, liking. Um, I want to show you some close-ups of my famous. So this is this is one of the most famous open clusters, and it's a classic open cluster. It's the Pleiades cluster. It's significant because you can actually see it on the sky with your naked eye. You guys might have noticed before those little twinkling stars. They call them the Seven Sisters. It's the same thing as the the uh, the the, the Subaru logo, I don't know. Anyways, you can see this with your naked eye twinkling on the sky. Notice you can see about 50 objects. These are bright and these are blue. And I want you to contrast them with globular clusters. These are made of old dim red stars and there are hundreds of thousands of them and they're all swirling around each other in a really intense gravitational orbit. You, this is kind of like ever see a swarm of bees. This is like a swarm of stars. Now, I want us to try a little exercise where we compare the masses and the luminosities and the temperatures of stars in general, okay? Uh, everyone cool if I race? All right. So let us contrast the spectral types of stars. And you guys uh, should know your spectral types Okay, I've got my, I don't want to mix up my markers here, so I'm going to put these out of my way. So we have O, B, and A stars. Those are the bluish kind of stars. Fine girl, so F, I'm going to use green for G. Uh, you guys will remember that our own sun peaks. In, uh, its radiation spectrum peaks at 520 nanometers, um, which is green. So I'll, I'll use that for a G type star. And then the K and the M stars, these are low mass and usually dim. So I've got this shadow here. Um, do you guys remember the four properties of a star? that we want to discover to learn their physics and their life, their lifestyle and what they do when they die. What are the four key properties of a star? Mass, luminosity, radius, and uh, one more. Temperature. 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 You, did, you did pretty good though. You did pretty good. Okay. So remember, uh, Arunsak, I want to, I want to discuss the range. So let's discuss, um, for instance, let's just do temperature ranges, okay? Um, typically, the temperature ranges of an O-type star are as high as 30,000 Kelvin, right? And um, the lowest mass stars have temperatures of around 3,000 Kelvin. And then a G-type star will have a temperature of around 6,000 Kelvin. I'm going to ask you to kind of try to memorize some numbers associated with the highest mass stars, the lowest mass stars, and we'll also remember our sun because our sun is 
our star, and we should know some deets about that. But this will help you avoid having to memorize everything. We're just going to memor memorize a couple of numbers. Now, I want to ask you guys a question, and I already know that you're not going to understand what I mean, but I think we have to have this talk anyways. How many orders of magnitude can the temperatures of stars vary by? Do you guys know what I mean when I say order of magnitude? Does that mean anything to you? Okay, that's what I was afraid of. But this is the way scientists talk to each other, and you're trying to learn some things about how scientists talk to each other. When I say an order of magnitude, I mean powers of 10. So let's write this out together. Um, how many orders of magnitude, uh, excuse me, do, uh, the temperatures, do the temperatures of stars vary? Order of magnitude means basically 10 to the power of X. And you're trying to figure out what X is. How many powers of 10? A factor of 10, a factor of 100, a factor of 1,000. It could also be a factor of a 10th, a factor of a 100th, a factor of a 1,000th. To go from 3,000 to 30,000 is a change of how many orders in magnitude? That's not too hard, right? So what's the answer? Come on. You yeah, you're not even trying. Look, it's 10. 10 to the power of one means one order of magnitude. O stars are 10 times hotter. The, the hottest stars are 10 times hotter than the coolest stars. Okay, why don't we try a different one? Why don't we try masses? Um, what are the range of stellar masses? And we want to know how many orders of magnitude, but I didn't feel like writing all that down. Let's look at the HR diagram. You guys need to explore the HR diagram with your own eyeballs if this class is to succeed, if you are to become wise. Remember that we can only really measure masses along the main sequence. And I'm going to explain that in just a moment. OK. What is roughly the lowest mass a star can have? 0 0.1. 0 0.1 solar mass units. What's the greatest mass a star can have? 60. 60. Um, We've measured them out to 100, so we're going to use the number 100 as the upper end, OK? So for the for O-type stars, they can be up to 100 solar mass units. And for M-type stars, as low mass as a tenth of a solar mass unit. How many orders of magnitude, students? Play the game with me. Humor me. You have to. Someone put me in charge. Three. Three orders of magnitude. Nice. This is how scientists talk to each other. They vary by three orders of magnitude. Nice. Um, could we just have a slowdown here to talk about this? Mass turns out to be one of the most important parameters of a star. And I believe it was Austin who helped us identify that. Uh, on our last class. Why would there be a lower range to stars and why would there be an upper range to the mass of stars? Why can't I have an arbitrarily small star? Why can't I make a little star this big and just put it in my pocket and take it to the store with me? Why, why can't, why couldn't this be a star? 
what makes something a star anyways? Do we have a working definition for star? What separates a star from a big ball of plasma? The fusion. That's right, Christopher. Christopher, you're right there and swinging for the fences, okay? Listen, this is our working definition for a star from now on. Our working definition for a star is ball with fusion. Christopher, can you suggest a reason why stars could not have a mass of less than a tenth of the sun's mass? I want to guess that there wouldn't be like enough thing to like start the fusion process. And you're exactly correct. There would not be enough self gravitation to raise the central temperature up of the star to a critical value all right, mega bonus points if you can tell me the temperature. What temperature do I require for hydrogen to undergo fusion? This might be asking a little too much of you, but I want to try. Nine, nine K, nine thousand nine Kelvin. Kelvins, nine thousand Kelvin. I can't be, it can't be, otherwise stars would have fusion at their surfaces, right? It's way higher than that. Okay, let's, let's write this down. This is something I want you all to know. The uh, temperature for hydrogen fusion. Is it 15 million Kelvin? Yeah, who, is, who said that? I recognize Kevin. your voice. Kevin, that's right. Kevin, nicely done, sir. 15 million Kelvin. That's the central temperature of the sun. It's close to 15 million Kelvin. That's going to be our working, that's going to be our working number. Um, what do you think would happen if nature attempted to form a star and it had slightly less than 10% of the sun's mass? It wouldn't have fusion, but what would it look like? Could you imagine? It's a black hole, black hole. No, it would not have enough self-gravity to become a black hole. I want to guess like, oh, I forget what they're called, like basically Jupiter, but really big. That's right, uh, like a bigger version of Jupiter. And they call these suckers brown dwarfs. And they're very difficult to observe, but people do suspect they're out there. I think I even have, so because we don't, you know why we don't have any pictures of brown dwarfs? Because they're really dim, so you're not gonna find them. This is when we have to rely on our weed smoking artist friends to draw us a picture. So we call up our weed smoking artist friends and we say, hey bro, could you draw me a picture of, of a brown dwarf because I can't actually capture that with my telescope. And then they get off the bean bag and they take out the paints. And before you know it, they draw a picture that looks like this or let's go and look for some cool space art, shall we? Um, brown, this could actually have very bad results, but dwarf, uh, I'm hoping, yes. So this would be, um, guys, you got to give it up for space art sometimes. There's a need for space art because we cannot directly image these things, but we want to imagine what they look like. This was a talented weed smoking artist who was able to draw a nice picture for us. And you'll notice they pretty much made the thing look like a, a version of Jupiter. They made a space Jupiter. Jupiter could kind of be considered a brown dwarf. Its mass is a thousandth of the sun's mass. So it's a big ball of hydrogen and helium that does not have enough gravity for self-sustaining fusion. Okay, now I wanna ask you a peskier question. Chris realizes that you need at least this much mass to become a ball with fusion. But then if I have more and more mass, I should have more and more gravitational pressure and more temperature. Why can I not have an arbitrarily massive star? Why couldn't I just crush the entire Milky Way galaxy into one big star? Wouldn't that have enough gravity to ignite fusion? Why, why would there be an upper limit to stars at all? There's no reason you should know the answer to this question, but I want to challenge you to think about it. Is it the Pauli exclusion principle? Uh, the Pauli exclusion principle keeps uh, quantum particles like electrons from having the same quantum state. So th it's, this is a very different scale of things. Although the Pauli exclusion principle does end up supporting stars. So bringing that up is not as zany as you might think, but it's, it's, 
I, I want to sh- like, yeah, yes, it's because the amount of gravity kind of disrupts the fusion process. You're very close to the correct answer. It's not that gravity disrupts the process. It's that gravity makes so much fusion that the star literally blows itself apart. And I want to show an example of a star that's undergoing such a process. It's very rare to see this. Let me uh, introduce you to a famous object known as Eta Carina. Eta Carina is a star which has exceeded its so-called Eddington luminosity and is in the process of radiating itself to death. So uh, this is probably the best picture of it that we have here. Uh, Come on, you bastard. There we go. All right, check out this bad boy. It's a star, or it was a star. It's got so much pressure, and fusion has gone so haywire that literally the photons themselves, it's generating so many gamma rays that the star is actually blowing itself apart due to its own radiation. I actually have a little demo on this, if you're all interested. Um, uh, This is the demo, but I want to start here with the Newton's Cradle. Remember that objects with mass, like these little BBs here, they have momentum associated with them. Uh, Momentum is the product of an object's mass times its velocity. And momentum can be transferred from one massive object to another massive object. Normally, you wouldn't think of a photon as having momentum because photons are electromagnetic waves and they have no mass associated with them. No mass, no momentum, or so you would think. Um, I want to show you this device. Bear with me here, students. Ah. Hopefully I didn't break it. Uh, okay, this thing, oh, I know the snow, uh, oh, could you send me a link in the chat, um, whoever said that, the, I, I think I'm familiar with the Snowball Nebula, I want to show you guys a beautiful object that I tricked the department into buying for me, this is known as a Crooks radiometer, or a light mill, It's a delicate piece of glass with a partial vacuum inside. And there's a little delicate um, sort of weather vane there with silver edges. And it's balanced on a needle. Um, Is this the Snowball Nebula? Let's click on that. Oh, wow. Oh, this is a planetary nebula. This This is related but it's not exactly the same thing. But first I need to do a demo with you guys. Okay, let's put that right there. I need to get the bright light bulb. Okay, normally you wouldn't think, uh, I need to, I need like a doodah. I need a brick or something. And let's see if we can adjust, uh, I need to get that Logitech, Logitech capture out. And I'm gonna plug in this. Hello, can you hear me? I lost audio for a second, sorry. Opening up Logitech really pisses off the machine here. Um, I need to open up Logitech so I can adjust my focus. Okay, let me do this here. Cool. All right, I'm hoping this will be worth it. So do you guys see the weather vane? All right, now I'm gonna plug in this lamp, okay? I'm going to generate some light. 
Oh, fuck. That was not what I wanted to happen right now. Oh, okay. What a klutz I am. Look at that. Well, hold on. That demo was going to be really good. That was a 120 uh, watt bulb, which I really needed. Oh, what a fucking mess. This is not what I was expecting to happen. All right, let's see if I can finish the demo. I know, I know. Um, this bulb is not as bright, but I'm going to try it, and hopefully I won't break it this time. Oh, that was such a clumsy thing to do. All right, let's see if I can push the weather vane here. I really needed that 120 watt volt uh, bulb. Come on, buddy. Damn it. This is only 40 watts. It's not enough. Would like a laser pointer work? No, it, laser mm. pointers are not high enough wattage. I'm also stepping on crunchy glass right now, so this is not this is not a great situation. All right. Let's try this again. Oh man, not only did I make a mess and I lost that light bulb, but I also ruined the demo, which is the thing I'm really most disappointed about. That was gonna be a really cool, oh, it's a bloody mess over here, guys. All right, just give me a second while I deal with this. Hey, Professor, you got Cash App? Uh, I'll help. I'm sorry, can you say something? What? You have Cash App, we can help you out. No, 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 it's not, it's not, uh, uh, it's not about the money. It's, it's that I, I don't have another hundred. I can find an, another bulb somewhere. Let's just, come on, I got one more thing to try. I don't know what the luminosity of this is, but I, I found it in my yuppie lux loft here. I'm hoping that it'll have enough juice to give you guys a good show. All right, let's see. Can I save the demo? Oh yeah, baby. Look at it go. Look at it go. Yes. Now listen, yay, Emily's got, do you see what this means? Do you understand what this means? It means that light can push matter. Light can push matter. This is called photon pressure. Is this the principle behind solar sails? This is the principle behind solar sails. Do you see? Wow, I really picked a good one. I'm using this bulb now. Look how fast that bugger is going. Do you guys see this thing? It's freaking cruising, and that's just light. Wow, I feel like there was a lot of high drama in that uh, in that demonstration there. So, <laughs> okay, all right. Do you see how fast that thing is going? Yeah. Exactly, Christopher. Um, guys, can you just give me one second while I get a dustpan and sweep up all the crunchy uh, glass that's underneath my feet right now? I'm going to be stepping on this stuff for weeks. It's everywhere. It's all over the bloody floor.
class, sorry. That turned out to be a whole damn thing. Anyways, you'll never forget that stars can exert radiation pressure, right? That was the Olive Garden breadstick. What the shit are you guys talking about? All right, I don't understand, but I don't need to understand. Okay. Um, let me put this, let me put this away before I do something else stupid. Um, okay, let's talk about ranges of stellar radii. I remember, do you guys remember last class? Let's look up, let's look up the ranges of stellar radii as well. Okay. Oh, by the way, so there's a name for this. It's called the Eddington luminosity. The Eddington luminosity is the point where stars shine themselves apart. And 100 solar mass stars are basically close to, to that tipping point. Okay. Let's ask about stellar radii. Do you guys remember I showed you a video showing you the range of stellar radii in the last class? Let's go to our HR diagram. And can you guys tell me, uh, we'll have to go to the entire HR diagram this time. Slide 81, function F581. What's the lowest radius a star can have? And what's the greatest? I'm going to turn my heat down and you guys tell me the answer when I get back. Okay, ranges of stellar radii, give them to me. What's the lowest? I see the lowest around like 10 to the, I think that's a three, 10 to the negative three. Yep, and, and the, the highest? highest looks like 10 to the six. No, not 10 to no. the six. Hold on, maybe I stopped that too quick. It's up here. Do you see my mouse? A run sec? It looks like 10 to the three. 10 to the three. Okay. So um, the largest stars, which are red giants, sometimes they call them super giants. They can have 10 to the three, like Betelgeuse is about a thousand times greater than the sun. And then the so-called dwarf stars, like Proxima Centauri, actually white dwarfs are the tiniest. Those are 10 to the minus three. How many orders of magnitude is that, students? One. This is my unhappy face. Do it right. Do it better. Subtract better. Six. That's right six orders of magnitude or a factor of 1 million. Do you guys remember how dramatic that video was when I was like zooming back and forth? I don't want to do it again because remember last time it crashed my lecture and it made a whole mess. So I don't want to do that again. But you could see that the stars had like a huge dramatic range in radii. Now it's time for us to get to the good stuff. Let's talk about the luminosities. What about the range of stellar luminosities? And this is something you really have to think about. What would be, let's see here. What is the lowest and what is the highest luminosity a star can have on the HR diagram? 10 to the negative five and 10 to the six. Um, let's go with 
10. Uh, let's go with 10 to the minus three. I, I, the, the graph certainly goes down to 10 to the minus five. But Christopher, if we took Proxima Centauri, you can see that's about as dim as a star can get, okay? So um, the, I would say 10 to the power of six solar luminosities, and, and that's an O-type star versus 10 to the minus three. And how many orders of magnitude is that, students? Nine. Nine. And now you're supposed to say, holy cow. Okay. Nine orders of magnitude. I want you to really think about what this means. Um, can I show you... Uh, Let's just look at the Pleiades again. Let's look at a star cluster. Where's that other picture that shows both of them? Fine, here, we'll just go to this picture. Look at these O stars, and remember that there could be other red stars in the foreground or in the background. How many reds, how many dim red M type stars does it take to equal the luminosity of just one O? Is it nine? Not nine. Not nine. No, nine red stars does not equal one blue star. Maybe I'm asking this question the wrong way. When I look, I wanna show you guys a picture of a galaxy that I like. I wanna show you guys a picture of the pinwheel galaxy. It's quite beautiful. Um, the pinwheel galaxy is a typical face-on spiral, a grand design spiral maybe. Look at this beautiful picture. What color are the spiral arms? Blue, white. So they're bluish, right? The spiral arms. So what spectral types must make up these stars in the spiral arms? What spectral types are contributing to the light from the spiral arms? You know what I mean by spectral type, right? Ob, if I'm girl, kiss me. The, Ob here. and uh, oh, it would it would be the the blue, um, the the hotter ones, the 30k ones, yes. which is 30, the 30K. O's, O's, the O's and the B's. And actually, Christopher, it turns out that you're right. A's contribute a bit too. So that must mean, but wait a minute, could there be K and M stars buried in there as well? They're dimmer than the blue stars, right? Say I took a little patch of blue star stuff. How many M stars would I require to rival the luminosity of one O star? How many M, so these are the M stars down here. You need 10, right? Oh, you guys still aren't understanding me. And this is an O type. How many to, ri to rival, to rival in luminous luminosity, right? Yes. Okay. The answer is right there, guys. 10 billion? Not 10 billion. A billion. 1 billion. The 10 to the 9 is 1 times 10 to the 9, right? You would need 1 billion M-type stars, 1 billion Proxima Centauri's to equal 1 Rigel. Just think about how crazy that is. There could be up to half a billion red stars buried in here, and you wouldn't even see them because the light would be completely dominated by the O-type stars. Notice that the color of the bulge, this is actually made up of light from zillions and zillions, well, billions of stars. Notice the light is quite reddish towards the center of the galaxy. That tells me that there's probably no O-type stars there. Or if there are any O-type stars buried in there, they've got to be at the level of less than one 
one out of a billion stars. Because if there was even one for every billion red stars, this would turn blue. This tells me that this is made up of old dim red stars. And this is an old part of the galaxy. This part of the galaxy is a very young part of the galaxy where star formation takes place. Yeah, go ahead. I'll run sec. Why would the center be older than the, the outer arms? That's a great damn question. Um, normally, I would have that as a cliffhanger, but the, ch the reality is we're probably never going to quite get there because we're going to run out of time. Arunsak, galaxies form and evolve in complicated ways, but we there are, there are two different reasons. It could be that the center of the galaxy formed first through mergers, and it used up all of the gas for star formation. Uh, you Okay, so hold on a second. The problem with answering questions in astronomy is there's lots of little pieces of the puzzle. You need to understand what I'm saying. So first, let me show you one last thing. Um, I want you to look at that HR diagram one more time. And I want you to recognize that there's a huge difference in the lifetimes of these stars. And let's see if you guys can count. Or actually, Runsack, you're going to do this with me. What is the typical lifetime? How long will an O-type star live? What does that mean, 10 to the 7? 20 years. Uh, I think that's 10, 100 million years. Not 100 million. 10 to the 7. Here's how you do this, Arunsac. Uh, 10 million years. That's right, because this is the same as 10 times 10. I hate drawing this thing. 10 times 10 to the 6 is the same as 10 to the 7. So these things live for 100, uh, sorry, 10 million years, right? 10 million years. How long does a typical M type star live? Trillion years. No, a trillion is 12. 100 billion. 100 billion. So the idea is that 100 billion years is a long time. 10 million years is a short time, OK? So the idea, Arunsak, is that either the center of the galaxy forms first from the merger of different objects, or this part of the galaxy was so dense that it burned up all of its gas and made all these. At one point, the center of the galaxy would have had all these different stars in it, O types and B types and A types. But the O's and the B's died off and went supernova and got rid of the gas. So all that was left were the little old feeble K and M stars. In fact, the fact that you see blue stars at all in the spiral arm means these are areas where active star formation is taking place. If you see any blue light at all, that means stars were forming there in the last 10 million years, which is a short time, galactically speaking. Yes. So is that a common theme in like most galaxies where the center would be generally older versus the outer would be younger? Indeed, except there are some other weird types of galaxies. But if we're talking about spirals, then hell yeah. Let me show you another beautiful spiral I love. It's almost like appreciating a... Appreciating a spiral galaxy is like appreciating a fine wine. They're so each of them are beautiful and unique in their own way. Look at this one, Arunsak, and you'll see the exact same thing going on. Beautiful, uh, well, this is gonna be super high res. This is gonna be awesome. Beautiful blue spiral arms where star formation is taking place. And then towards the center of the galaxy, they call this the bulge. Notice how red the light is towards the bulge. And so once again, Arunsak, just like you predicted, we're seeing all old K and M type stars here. By the way, if you study the amounts of gas, there's no gas here, but there's lots of gas there. That's one of the things I want to talk about today, but I'm kind of wasting a lot of time goofing off with you guys. Okay, before I get to talking about gas and star formation, I want to kind of connect all of this stuff to, to binary stars for a second. So allow me to go on another riff that I think will be helpful. Um, I think it's cool to take time to look at galaxies because they, ex they excite me. I think gal galaxy astronomy is really interesting. Um, the properties that we care about with a star are M, L, R, and T. And remember that last time I introduced something called the Stefan Boltzmann law for stars.
And that was a relationship between three of these quantities. The luminosity of a star goes as r squared t to the fourth. When I plot stars on an HR diagram, I get their temperatures, I get their luminosities, and that means I can solve for the radii. Actually, that's not really, I should put the formula right. It's four pi r squared sigma t to the fourth. Um, there is a problem on solving for stellar radii. I can't remember if we do it today. The radius of a star goes as the square root of L over four pi Stefan Boltzmann constant temperature of the fourth. I can measure these two quantities. I can solve for the radius of the star. But you know what? The mass, this is the odd guy out. We need a method for measuring the masses of stars. Anyone want to take a guess what that method is? I thought so. You find the masses through the study of binary stars. That's the point. If it wasn't for the fact that so many stars are in the form of binaries, we would actually know a lot less about the universe than we do today. Binaries were a secret gift from the gods to us to allow us to determine the masses of stars. And now we're going to do a little module on that. By the way, this is a big deal because I'm going to ask you not one, not two, but like 10 questions on binary star masses on your exam. <laughs> Caitlin's already excited. I can feel it's palpable, the excitement that Caitlin's uh, feeling about solving binary star masses. <laughs> All right, let me erase and, and we'll learn. It's not as bad as you think, buddy, not as bad as you think. Okay. Let's take a look at a binary star. So um, using binaries to get stellar masses. All right, so I've got a binary star. Um, we can call it an A star and a B star. They'll be separated by a semi-major axis A, and one star is going around the other, something like this. I probably shouldn't use A and B because those are actually spectral types, and this could get a little confusing. Um, I guess I'll call them number one and number two, OK? All right. Remember that if you can measure the period and the radius of orbit, you can solve for the mass using NK3 solved for mass. And up to now, the version that you've been familiar with is the one that says that M1 plus M2 is equal to four pi squared A cubed over GP squared. Do you all remember what the units are for this formula? I think A is center to center distance. G is a constant in, uh, I forgot what, what it was. What about the units of RUNSAC? Thank you, Emily. What about the units? A is a distance. What units should we use for our distance? Uh, there's little teeny pieces of glass all over the floor. I'm going to be stepping on this crap for weeks. OK, what? Use bread? Oh, I'll figure it out. Units. Fine. I don't feel like waiting for you guys. Um, it's MKS units, right? That's how you had to do it on your test. A was measured in meters. P was measured in seconds, and the masses were measured in kilograms. I'm here to tell you today that there is a better version of the formula. This is what you've used up to now because you are learning. There's a secret version of NK3 called the Kitty Edition. 
I'm going to put it up here because I don't want to kneel down and put my knees in the glass. Introducing NK3, I call it the kitty edition of the formula because it uses cute units that are easy to measure. It's M1 plus M2 equals A cubed over P squared, where A is measured in astronomical units, P is measured in years, and the masses are measured in solar mass units. Okay, Runsack, we'll see you later, buddy. This version makes solving for the total masses of stars extremely easy. Extremely easy. For instance, why don't we try this, guys? Suppose a binary has a separation of 5AU. Really? Sorry? I don't understand. Wait, a run sec. Are you are you meaning to be? Oh, live? sorry, 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 my bad. Okay, all right, yes. So, um, suppose a binary has a separation of five AU in a period of four years. Can you guys quickly tell me the total mass of the system? Let's do it together, or let's, everyone punch it up for me. You know what to do, right? What do you get to one significant figure? Eight. Units? Solar mass units. So if they were equal in mass, they'd each be four solar masses, right? That's not always the case, but if, if the two are equal to each other, what spectral types would those be, Christopher? Let's look at our HR diagram. If I had two stars that were each four solar mass units, what would their spectral types be? Like F or something? Mm. F or A? F is like one and a half. A is like three solar masses. A or B, okay. I would say. So. Yeah. They'd be somewhere at the third arrow, right? Okay, something like that. Um, sometimes we have to use tricks to get the A. Usually the period is easily measurable, but getting the A requires some trickery, okay? Let's look at two different ways we could get the A, and these are ways which you will have to use as well. Um, geez, I'm doing bad on time here. I'm just going to, I'm going to spend the rest of the moments I have dealing with this. I don't want to shortchange you guys in this because I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. So it's, it's fair that I really prepare you for it. Um, may I erase? Okay. I want you to consider two different scenarios. Um, so the point of the next module is that Finding the A or measuring the A can be tricky. Okay, let's take the case of a visual binary. How does a visual binary work?
No one? You can see that there's two stars orbiting each other. Beautiful, Caitlin. Love it. Let's imagine that I've got two of those stars and I'm over here on Earth and I'm looking at them. This is actually a project I did with, um, with my friend who's a professor at Brown and one of his students. We actually, uh, well, we used the second method, but we did something like this. Um, these two stars are separated by some distance, okay? Um, in this case, let's consider a famous visual binary Sirius A and B. I want to show you guys a picture and we'll get their angular separation real quick. Let's go to Wikipedia. Grab some data about Sirius. Oh, shoot. Uh, get out of here. Sirius the star. Okay. Let's go to Wiki. And I want to know the angular separation, but I want to show you a picture of Sirius A and B. Um, by the way, if you guys want to know how to find the brightest star in the sky, do you guys see Orion here? Here's Orion, the hunter. And Orion is followed by two dogs as he travels from east to west through the sky at night. Canis Minor, the little dog, is here with the bright star Procyon. And Canis Major, the big dog, follows directly at his heels. And Sirius, for this reason, is sometimes referred to as the dog star. Now, when you see it on the nighttime sky, it's just a bright AF star, as the kids say. But if you have a powerful telescope, you can actually discover that it's got a faint white dwarf companion next to it. And this is, well, this is a weed smoking artist picture, but we actually have a direct image of Sirius A and B. So Sirius A is the bright star, there's Sirius B. The real picture is less sexy than the artist picture. So there you can see the two stars. Now, they're separated by, um, I, want this, I want the details of the orbit. They're separated by 7.5 arc seconds, and they have a period of 50 years. So let's see if we can work through this. Uh, I want you to understand how this might appear during an exam, OK? So suppose I have Sirius A and B. They're separated by an angular separation of 7.5 arc seconds, OK? And I know that the orbital period of the system is 50 years because people have been watching it. I'm also going to tell you one other thing about them. I'm going to give you their parallax shift. So we're going to put a lot of different things together here. This might be a little bit overwhelming. The parallax is 0.379 arc seconds. Do you guys remember how to get the distance to Sirius from this? How do I get the distance from the parallax shift? There's a super easy formula to do this. Is it the uh, small angle formula? No, we're going to use that next. But we can't use the small angle formula until we have the distance. And we have to get the distance from the parallax. No one remembers the parallax formula? It's like the easiest formula ever. Maybe I should give you the um, second equation sheet so you guys can start using it. It's one over P. Yeah. P, uh, what about shift, right? OK, so could you guys do that? Come on, guys, punch them up. I know you're getting tired, but play along with me here. No. Caitlin, 1 divided by 0.3 cannot be 0 
two point six. What are the units? Parsecs. <clears throat> okay, we're gonna leave it in parsecs, and here's why. We can now use this plus the kitty version of the small angle formula to get the angular separate or to get the physical separation. Remember that A is the distance between the two stars, right? Now I will use the small angle formula. I call it part three. It's the simple version to get the separation between the stars. The small angle formula part three is S is just alpha times D, where if I plug in an angle in arc seconds, if I plug in 7.5 arc seconds times the distance in parsecs, the answer will magically come out to be astronomical units. So what is 2.6 times 7.5? Nineteen point five, and the units just perfectly come out to be AU. Now think about so remember it, guys. The the trick here is to remember the units for this. S is an AU. A is an arc seconds, and D is in parsecs. One of the reasons parsecs were invented is to make this formula wicked easy. Now we can find the masses of the two stars. The masses of Sirius A plus the mass of Sirius B is A cubed over P squared. Nineteen point five cubed over fifty years squared. And why don't you punch that up for me? Three. Three? Yeah. Maybe. It's 2.96, so that would round up to three. And the units? Uh, solar mass units. Let's see how it compares with the total mass of the two systems. Um. So the mass of Sirius A is two, and the mass of Sirius B is one. That worked out perfectly, didn't it? Nice. Very cool. Okay, so that's a cute little exercise of how we could find the mass using a visual binary. I really like that exercise because you had to do three different things from the class. I've since erased it, but you had to use parallax, you had to use the small angle formula part three, and then use the kitty edition of NK3. What I also like about this is this goes from real actual observations to measuring the masses of stars. This is very much like what an astronomer would do. Um, there's one more variation on this, and I'm just going to give you the note real quick and dirty because I know you guys want to break here before we do homework. But let me say that there's, well, first of all, can I erase this? Any objections? All right. There's another situation where we have the case of a spectroscopic binary. Unlike the visual binary, a spectroscopic binary is fundamentally an unresolved pair. And that means when you look, you can only see one star, but you end up knowing that there are two stars there. Why? Because when you take the spectrum of the stars, this is what you end up seeing. Um, let's see if I can do this right here. Okay. 
you take the spectrum of your single star, and instead of seeing one set of absorption lines, you see two sets of absorption lines which are shifting back and forth. In this animation here, you're the observer here on Earth. You can't actually resolve these two stars or see them, but when you take their spectra, you can see those Doppler, you can see the lines shifting back and forth according to something called the Doppler effect or the Doppler shift. The Doppler shift is a change in the wavelength of a star's absorption line due to its motion. And it's just a property that waves have. When, when waves move towards you, they make a higher pitch. When they move away from you, they make a lower pitch in the audio domain. Um, and it's also true in the light domain. So usually what happens is you take the spectrum You see two sets of Doppler shifted absorption lines. You then use the Doppler shift to find the velocities of the stars. And then you use the velocity to find A using the binary star formula. An exercise will take a little bit too much time. So I want you to just take those notes down and I'll explain the details next time. Okay. I need to take a little break. Are you guys down with the 15 minute break before we do some homework? I sure hope today's lecture has something to do with our homework, but we'll see. Um, I'll see you guys in about 15, okay? Peace. Okay, Astronomy 1020. Welcome back. It's time for our homework session. Homework number eight. We're in consultation with my fellow students here. We have decided to change one of the homework problems to make today's homework a little nicer, a little sweeter, a little shorter. Um, and to that effect, we are gonna make a modification and I'm gonna put this into Blackboard. Today's homework number eight will feature chapter 16. Can you read me the original questions again, Caitlin, if you don't mind? Yes, sir, it is number 50, 52, 55, 56, and then 59. Oh, okay, so you had already swapped. What's the one that I was gonna swap out, 53? 53. Okay, so I am making a command decision in consultation with the class to replace homework number 53, let me get to speaker view here, with 59 instead. That will be better related to our lecture and it will be a little gentler on our systems today. I know my system is feeling fragile. Okay, so um, because I'm a forgetful person, before we begin, I'm actually gonna make that mod to Blackboard just in case students don't watch any of this, which they frequently don't. Um, I wanna make sure it's a clearly recorded mod here. We are doing homework eight. We are going to edit uh and it would be kind of cool if i could use strike through yeah look at that we're going to use some strike through okay are people going to understand this i have no idea okay 53 replaced with 59. you know what no one's going to try to do this on them by themselves anyway that would be suicide Okay, um, I'm ready to go. If y'all ready to go, uh, I'm so good to you guys. I know I'm really the best. Um, okay, so uh, let's start with, uh, don't forget to put your name. And uh, honestly, you know what my objection was? 53 is kind of a badass problem about uh, dust grains, but I didn't get to the interstellar medium today. These questions are kind of related to stuff we talked about. So I like there to be a synergy between the lecture and the homework. 
Uh, it also happens to be that that's a really long problem. So we get a double win. Um, and homework number eight, don't forget to put astronomy 1020 as always with your section number, whatever your section is. Okay. And we're rocking chapter 16, number 50. And a run sack, you're first in my Hollywood squares today. So while I eat a bite of pod gras pow, you can read the question to me. Are you asking me to read? Yes, sorry. All righty, hold on, I gotta pull it up. Take your time. I got stuff to do over here. Mm. Okay, does someone have their shit together besides Ren <laughs> All right, Christopher, would you mind? Sure, 50. Yeah. Okay. Stupid thing. Uh, all right, 50 light from a newborn star cluster. <clears throat> Suppose a new star cluster is born with one O star, 10 A stars, 100 G stars, and 1000 M stars. Which stellar type dominates the light output from the cluster? Was it a what? thousand M stars? Yes. Christopher, do you think you already know the answer to this question? Because I bet you do. I want to stay the O stars. Yeah. Well, the O star. O star. Um, why don't we make this actually, guys? Can we reorganize this? Let's make it a let's make it a slicky ricky table. Let's make it slick. And what we will do is we will quantify it directly by making a table listing the number of stars, the luminosity of the stars, and the total luminosity. So feel me on this one if you can. So this will be the heading. And then we'll have one for O stars, one for A stars, one for G stars and one for M stars. Okay. So this will be the, um, <clears throat> the number This will be the luminosity of the star. This will be the total luminosity. And here we'll have the spectral type. And they selected for us O, A, G, and M. And Christopher, help, help me remember here, it's one O, 1O, 10A, 100G, and 1000M. Okay. Do you guys remember any of the luminosities of these stars in solar luminosity units? I bet you know what the luminosity of a G-type star is. All right. Let's grab our HR diagram. One thing that might not be obvious to you guys that is obvious to me is if these stars are newborn, if they're recently formed, that means they are all on the main sequence. So we will use only stars along the main sequence to estimate their luminosities. All right, Christopher, what do you think is the typical luminosity of an O star? That would be 10.6. Uh, mm, not 10.6. My God, 10 to the power of six. And the units? Solar luminosity units. Excellent. 
So I just wrote that down in my chart there. I know I'm a little tiny box right now, but I'll, I'll zoom in again. Why don't we try an A star? An A star would be like Sirius, right? N. Yeah, about 10 solar luminosity units. How about a G type G star? One. Right, like the sun. And how about the M type stars? Like Proxima Centauri. 10 to the negative three. All right. So let's remember all that. So 10 to the six, 10, one, 10 to the minus three. You guys remember how to do this, right? How do I find the total luminosity? What do I do next? <clears throat> Work with me, people. This is easy stuff. Would you like to add all the L things together? No, not add. Subtract. Wait, wait. Maybe I don't. Maybe I didn't make, make myself clear. This is the total luminosity of the O's. This is the total luminosity oh. of the A's. Okay, so you'd like multiply the number by the L thing, right? Right. So for this one, it's one times ten to the six solar luminosities. How about uh, A stars? One hundred. Yeah. Or 10 squared. I guess this one's also G one. is also 100. And then M is 1. Yeah. So we conclude the O star dominates the light output of the cluster and they asked for the color right uh, they asked for the color and uh, okay so it's what would the color of this star cluster appear to be if you observed it from a distance so great that you could not make out the individual stars I probably should have asked you guys to figure that one out on your own, but does that make sense? That if the O dominates the light yeah. cluster, that it'll be blue because the O stars are blue? Um, that's kind of like the situation that we had with Pleiades, if you remember. When we looked at Pleiades, the cluster is completely dominated by the bright blue stars, right? They totally overwhelm any other spectrum type. Where is he? All right. You ready to move on? Does anyone object to my erasing? Oh, sure, one sec. Take your time. Okay, I'm erasing, speak now or forever hold your peace. Caitlin, can I count on you for 52? Sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that's right. There's your fighting spirit. Okay. Chapter six, okay. 52. Okay. Hold on, I'm just pulling it up. Yep.
You said 52, right? Please. Okay. Water in molecular clouds. The water molecules now in your body were once part of a molecular cloud. Only about one millionth of the mass of a molecular cloud is the form of water molecules. And the mass density of such a cloud is roughly 10 to the negative 21 grams per centimeter cubed. Okay, hold on. I want to get all those givens again in the order they were. I'm sorry, I was a little behind you. No, what that's okay. Can you just uh, start where it finished up, was once in a molecular cloud, and then they started? Only about one million of the mass of a molecular cloud is in the form of water molecules. Hold on, let's pause there. How would we express one millionth numerically? Do you know how to do that? I do not. Well, do you know how many zeros are in a million? Uh, would six. It be 10 to the negative six. Yes, Christopher. See, oh. that's how we do it, Caitlin. We say 10 to the minus six is a million. Okay. One divided by a million. This is how we talk. But can you read it again? Because I want to say it was a millionth of the mass of the cloud is in the form of water molecules, correct? Yeah. So let me try to write an expression there. This is a millionth times the mass of the cloud. That will equal the mass of the water. And for dramatic fun, I will use my blue marker to write subscript H2O. So what they were trying to get us to write down there, and this, this is the thing that you need my help for. Learning how to go from words into an equation takes some practice, but it's good for you to watch it happen. What they were saying is the mass of the water is equal to a millionth times the mass of the cloud. Okay, proceed. Okay, and the mass density of such a cloud is roughly 10 to the negative 21 grams per centimeter cubed. Estimate the volume of a piece of molecular cloud that has the same amount of water as your body. How does the volume, how does this volume compare with the volume of the entire earth? Okay, find the volume of the water Um, they're not asking in your body, find the volume of a human's worth of water okay. in the giant molecular cloud. Um, this question is going to require some interpretation and some understanding. Most of you have no clue what they mean by a giant molecular cloud, but I should show you a picture of one because they're kind of freaking cool. Probably one of the most iconic and legendary giant molecular clouds are known as the pillars of creation. And it's just a very cool iconic image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of, uh, of what are called giant molecular clouds. This is a 6,000 pixel image. So hang on to your hats here. This might take a second. Okay, well, that one isn't. Okay, let's just like enjoy this thing here for a second. Uh, can I get a... Uh, what's going on here? Well, you guys can see this thing, right? You see it? This is what's called a giant molecular cloud. If you were to ask me, what is this thing made out of? I would tell you that it's pretty much got the same percentages as the sun. About 70% of it is in the form of hydrogen and about 28% of it is in the form of helium. And all the other stuff makes up just 2%. But in that 2%, there's a mixture of all kinds of wacky stuff wacky stuff that eventually gets crushed down into planets. So if you wanted to know where does our sun form from, my friend asked me that question the other day. They said, where did the sun come from? And I said, well, the sun is formed from collapsing molecular clouds. They're formed from collapsing gas clouds in between the stars. You can't form a star just anywhere, but 
you can tell that these clouds appear to be a little bit more dense than, than a typical uh, nebula in space. And these gas clouds are sometimes capable of getting crushed by gravity into a star. And of course, some of the material doesn't end up in the star. Some of the material ends up in the planets. Now, your body is comprised of, I don't know, what's the statistic? Is it two thirds water, 60%, 70% water? Something like that. Well, those water, uh, those water molecules weren't made by you. They were once dispersed all throughout this giant ass cloud. Every atom that makes up your body was once floating in the dark void of space. And then it got crushed down into planet Earth and you became a little goose sack from whatever materials were available there, right? Arunsak, what are you thinking? Tell me about your question. I don't know if I should ask it. Is it gonna make the homework longer? No, nah, no, nah, we have to have a little fun. This is, this. it doesn't make it longer, it makes it more tolerable. Just ask it, why not? Okay, cool. So if it were to get crushed into a sun, where is that, I mean, like I'm looking at it, where would the gravity come from? It just comes from nowhere and it starts crushing it? That's a really good question, and I'm going to address all that. I wanted to get to it today, but I didn't. So in our next lecture, oh, by the way, I meant to ask you guys something else. Next Tuesday is election day, right? Um, not that I want to get, God forbid, I don't want to turn this into some like political free for all, but I, there's only four of you, so everyone else is a troll. How many of you guys voted already? I did. Did you vote? Well, young people, get off your beanbag and go out and vote. Whoever you're voting for, just go out and do it. Participate in your goddamn democracy. Anyways, I wanted to say that I had a really good experience voting because what I did is, uh, I think last week after one of our classes, it was a Thursday, I just walked over to City Hall, which is a block from me, and I just waited in line for like five minutes, and then I voted, and it was wicked easy and good. Um, so I voted early. But the only reason I'm bringing this up in our astronomy class is next Tuesday is technically election day. So I don't know if some of you were planning on voting that day, but, oh, you mailed your ballot. Okay. I just, I don't know if that's going to conflict with class. Do we have class next Tuesday? Holy cow. Do we have next Tuesday off? I think, no, Ron Sack's saying, yeah, we do. No, no, but I think we have to address that because I forgot about this. My math teacher said we had the class off, so you might too. Yeah, I, I follow. So what I do is I follow the official CCRI schedule because that's how we're supposed to do it. Um, what's what's today? Today is the 29th, and next Tuesday is the 3rd of November. Oh, I have that as a lecture. What the heck? Oh, I'm confused. What's the official CCRI policy? We need to look this up. This is really important. Um, you guys know how to, this actually could be useful for you guys too. Um, if you're not used to the whole college thing, what you have to do is look up the CCRI calendar. I just- There's I know, no class. I just saw it, there's none. Fudge. Do you know what that means? That means I screwed up when I made the schedule and I forgot to include that as a day off. So this is kind of important that we're having this discussion, I guess. Ain't it now? Uh, wait a minute. I'm in the wrong goddamn semester. What? What? So you just looked it up, bud? Yeah. I would just like to confirm... I, uh, I put the link in the uh, chat. Uh, it should be clickable. Okay. Thank you, Paul G. I'm, I'm having a case of the stupids today. Um, so had anyone noticed this, that I had not scheduled that day off? It, it's all the way at the top. Ooh. Had any, like no one said anything. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we have to realize that in our calendar that I made for the class, I did not give this as a day off. So I'm gonna have to scratch that out. Um, and I guess we will not meet because I, I wanna follow the official character. So we have next Tuesday off, woo. Okay. 
Um, yeah, I'm glad we had that discussion. So anyways, let's get back to the problem. Uh, I, I was going somewhere with that, but I can't even remember what I was saying. I, I was just saying, go go out and vote, and now you have the whole day off to go out and vote. So that works out, all right? Uh, um, water and a molecular cloud. Okay, so let's draw a picture of a molecular cloud. Oh, a run sec. I'm going to explain how gravity starts to take over and do that. It takes a variety of, it's a whole damn thing, okay? So you're just going to have to stay tuned. So let's draw our molecular cloud. And the molecular cloud is full of gaseous atoms. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use blue. I use black for the regular atoms. And I'm going to use blue to represent the water molecules, which are sort of scattered randomly throughout there. What we're trying to figure out is how much gas would I have to suck up in order to get a human's worth of water? So what do you guys think the mass of a typical human being is? What's the mass of a typical human? I guess it's like 150 kilograms, no freaking way. Uh, I think it's like half of your, uh, it's 2.2 pounds equals one kilogram, right? So if I weigh 200 pounds on a good day these days, then my mass would be closer to like 100 kilograms. 150 kilograms would mean 300 pounds. I think that's a little, yeah, 75 to 100. Let's use me as a representation. I think I'm close to, I'm close to 200 pounds. Kilograms is 90 kilograms, okay? So we'll say the typical mass of a human. What percentage of that would you guys assist? By the way, the exercise that we're doing here is a classic thing that astronomers and physicists do. It's called a back of the envelope calculation. And usually the game starts off like this. Two astronomers are sitting at a bar and they're drunk. And one of them says to the other, hey, uh, how much molecular cloud do you think you'd have to scoop up to get enough water to make a human? And then the guy, other guy or the other girl says, oh, I don't know, I'm drunk, but we could probably figure it out if we made some reasonable guesses. And then they take some napkins and they start doing math on the back of the napkins and pretty soon nobody wants to talk to you okay so this is called the back of the envelope calculation but it's a very cool and fun exercise so let's play the game together what percentage of 90 kilogram mass what fraction of me is water and by the way after last night's whiskey not not as much as it used to be you know but what should be the amount of water in a typical person's body 73 percent says cameron i'll go with it um, okay, or let's just say 70% to make it easy. So Cam says 70% of a human should be water. So the mass of the H2O is, uh, is that what you got? 65.7 kilograms. We're going to keep it, ooh, whoa, I just got really dizzy all of a sudden. What the hell? Okay, so when you multiply those, you got... 63 kilograms? What? Wow, I just got really dizzy. Oh yeah, so let's say 63 kilograms. Whew. I don't know where that dizziness is coming from. Yeah, I should drink some. <laughs> I think that's probably a good idea. Guys, I do, normal, I do not normally get dizzy, so this is very weird. I don't know what's going on right now. If I, if I, if I fall down, and call for help. All right. Um, so the mass of the water is 63 kilograms. How could I? So, <laughs> oh no, did you say something mean? Okay. Oh no, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Maybe. You know what's funny? In the coronavirus times, any single thing that goes wrong with you any day, I don't know if you guys have this experience, but I'm like, that's it. I got it. I'm done. So I wake up with a hangover and I'm just like, oh, I got the Rona. And it turns out, nope, I'm just hungover. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, is my cloud also going to have a mass of 63 kilograms? How can I use this to find the mass of this cloud? I want to know that. <laughs> Uh, 
Wow, this chat log is taking a dark turn today. <laughs> what can I do with this? Tell me what to do, guys. I now know what fraction of my human is water, but I want to know if I'm 70% water, that would have been dispersed over a much bigger, over a much bigger cloud. I don't know the size of the cloud yet, but I can figure out the mass of the cloud. How can I figure out the mass of the cloud? Could you use the known density and the uh, mass of the water, the, 60, the 63 kilograms? We definitely want to use this, but we don't need the density just yet. The density is going to help us find the volume. The density, remember that we want to find the volume, and the volume will be related through the mass of the cloud. But we need the mass of the cloud, not just the mass of the water. There's something else that's going to let us figure out the mass of the cloud. You get it, right? I'm worried that you guys don't get it. All right, then what do I do? Tell me what to do. No? Maybe the, maybe I have failed you. That's got to be what it is. Do you multiply them? Multiply what? Uh, the 63 kilograms, the 10 to the negative 6. Well, hold on. This is the mass of the water that's in our body, which is this. We want to find the mass of the cloud. So if that was Kevin, I heard from there, I'm taking a guess by, by the timbre of your voice, I could solve for the mass of the cloud and what would the expression be? The mass of the cloud is what? Do you, oh, sorry. Was that Paul or Daniel? Okay, no, no, that's that's okay, Daniel. It's good, but I I don't see your faces very often, so I don't. Um, all right, let me just put this fucking simpler. Can you guys rearrange that for me? Do you know how to rearrange this? No, that's too much. Oh, do you divide it instead? Well, right, but remember, dividing and multiplying just means changing the negative. Yes, Cameron, I think Cameron understands me. If the mass of the water is a millionth the mass of the cloud, then the mass of the cloud is a million times the mass of the water. Do you see how that works? Because this is like one over 10 to the six. So we're flipping the 10 to the six up there. I was thinking that was going to be easy, but I don't know. All right, so if we multiply them together, we get 63 million kilograms. That's pretty easy. So that's the mass of our cloud. Remember that the goal is to find the volume. So what do I do next? I think it's good for you guys to try to think your way through this. I know you need my guidance, but you should try. What is, what is that um, weird symbol top right? Oh, this? Yeah. That's that's the Greek letter delta, and I often use that to represent density. I forgot that I didn't explain that to you. Sorry. Delta means density. You know about density, right? Mass divided by volume? Yeah, it's the treble clef. <laughs> um, it's the compactness of stuff, right? Okay, I think you guys need to slow down for a second and take a step back. What's the question asking us? Do you even know what the question asks? Honestly, no. I'm a little bit confused about what the question is. I figured. So could we reread it then? Uh, reread it again? They didn't quite ask for the mass. If they did, we'd be done, Cam. Caitlin, you're our. Uh, oh, yeah, a run sec. Are they asking for how much water is in the cloud? N they're not. They're not asking for how much. They're asking how much cloud would I need to slurp up 
so that I could get enough water to make a human. Oh, so what'd you do division? Well, you have to think about the parameter they're asking for. They're asking for the volume of the cloud, right? You know what volume is, right? Cubic meters, cubic centimeters. Maybe it would help if I gave you this formula. Density equals mass divided by volume, right? Okay, that's what I was thinking. So you get the 63 times 10 to the 6 divided by the delta up there, right? Um, hold on. We flip the volume. Yes, exactly. So the volume is the mass over the density, which is 63 million kilograms divided by the density of 10 to the minus 21 grams per cubic centimeter. But hold on, mayday, mayday. I see a problem here. Do you guys see the problem? We got an I issue. Know. Sorry? It's because of, uh, we got to turn kg into g. Yeah, and we could do that by just slapping on a dimensional analysis bar. Do you know what the conversion is from kg to g? Uh, 1,000 to 1. Yeah. Okay, so we'll run SAC. Work with me here. Why don't we see if we can do this whole bloody thing in our heads? 63 million, add three zeros. What do you get? Billion to the ninth. Billion. Now, since it's divided by negative 21, add 21 to that. It's 30. So 63 times 10 to the 30 cubic centimeters. That's the volume of our cloud. The next and last thing they want us to do is compare that to the volume of Earth. And I'm just going to march you through this nice and quick because, quite frankly, it doesn't seem like anyone cares that much. Um, the radius of Earth is 6,400 kilometers. And I'm going to convert that to centimeters by doing kilometers to meters, meters to centimeters. It's 1,000 meters per kilometer, 100 centimeters per meter, giving me 6.4 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. The radius of Earth is 6.4 times 10 to the 8 centimeters. Um, I need to erase this a little bit, too. I hope, am I going too fast here? The volume of Earth, if it's a sphere, is 4 thirds pi r cubed, which is 4 thirds pi 6.4 times 10 to the 8 centimeters cubed. Why don't you guys punch that up while I take another bite of my delicious um, meal? Well, any day now, eight times 10 to the 27 cubic centimeters. Can someone else confirm that? Can someone else just verify that they got the same number? Do I have to punch this? Because if I do, you're fired. Oh, good help is hard to find these days. 
eight, uh, six point four exp eight shift cubed. Yeah. Oh, I got one times ten to the twenty seven. Sup with that, cuz. I now got one point nine two, so I'm clearly doing something wrong. Wait. Yeah, I got one point ten. Well, screw the second digit. It's one times ten to the twenty seven. I don't know what the eight is all about. Okay. So how many times bigger is the volume of the cloud that contains the water in your body than the water than the volume of Earth? I'll race here. This means the volume of the cloud as a ratio to the volume of Earth, 63 times 10 to the 30 cubic centimeters over one times 10 to the 27 cubic centimeters. That's three zeros in a 63. So 63,000 times more, I'm gonna use a funny word, volumic. 63,000 times more volumic than Earth. In other words, to make enough water for one lousy punk ass human, you have to slurp up a volume of gas 63,000 times greater than Earth. So the water in your body was once dispersed over this epic volume of space. Cool story, bro. Okay. When you guys have that down, we'll move on. Boy, if you didn't like that, you really wouldn't have liked the um, the dust grain problem. Okay, <clears throat> that's called the back of the envelope calculation. It's a game. People play it. It's cool. I'm erasing. Um, Emily, would you and your birds read us a problem? Problem chapter 16, number 55. 55? All right. Um, I think this has to do with a formula called the genes mass, but go ahead and read it out to us. One second, let me pull it up. Uh, masses of the first stars. Okay. Models of the first star forming clouds indicate that they had a temperature of roughly 200 K and a particle density of roughly, roughly 300,000 particles per cubic centimeter at the time they started trapping their internal thermal energy. Estimate mass at which thermal pressure balances gravity for these values for pre of pressure and temperature. Okay, <clears throat> to do this problem, we need to use a legendary formula for astronomy. Didn't quite get to it today, but it's called the Jeans Mass Formula, named after the famous British astronomer, Sir James Jeans. The Jeans Mass is considered to be the formula for the condition for star formation. And believe it or not, this formula is the answer to the question that Arunsak asked me earlier. Arunsak thought it was gonna be a waste of class time and homework time, but little did he know that the question he was asking is directly related to two of our homework problems. The condition for star formation is that our cloud, which has some temperature, 
So the particles are all bopping around. Needs to have a balance between the density of particles, which leads to gravitational attraction, and the temperature, which causes the cloud to expand. In some ways, it's related to the condition of hydrostatic equilibrium. At one temperature, will the or what set of conditions will the mass of the cloud begin to contract? And skipping the derivation, which would bore you, Sir James Jeans discovered that the mass of the cloud to form a star would need to be greater than or equal to a reference mass, 18 solar masses, times the square root of the temperature cubed divided by the number density. In other words, Sir James Jean said, if you give me the temperature of the cloud, which is measurable, and if you give me the particle density of the cloud, which is measurable, I can tell you how much mass you need for gravity to capture the cloud and squish it into a star. If these are the conditions in the early galaxy for stars to form, let's calculate what masses are necessary. By the way, this is not an MKS unit formula. These go in in particles per cubic centimeter and these go in in Kelvin, which makes our job wicked freaking easy today. The mass of the cloud would need to be greater than or equal to 18 solar masses times the square root of 200 Kelvin cubed over uh, 300 particles per cubic centimeter. Uh, I don't need parentheses there, sorry. I do need parentheses there. Now, can you guys do that without me? Or you probably need my help for that, huh? Why don't you try it once without me and then I'll show the group how to do it. Uh, 2,939. That's what I got too. Hey, uh, Emily, you definitely gave me the right numbers there, right? I just want to verify that I have the correct formula for genes mass. Is it possible? That's, I knew it was going to be big, but that was stupid big. Uh, you're not going to like this version of it, but that's okay. I can translate. Uh, T cubed over N, radical thereof. Okay. That's the adult version. See, this is what we hide from you. In Astronomy 101, we don't show you stuff like that because that'll give you the willies. That would, that would make you hate me even more than you probably already do. Okay. So... Um, you got 2,900, and what are the units, Christopher? Um, one second. Okay, so you said T was? Kelvins. Kelvins, the N was? But you, this is a magic formula. We hid all the scary no. physics from you. But you didn't put in anything here. So it should this should be the units, right? Let me show you yeah. how Christopher I'm you know what, Christopher? I realize that the rest of these guys may not have gotten that. So let me show you what Christopher did to get that. Sorry. This isn't very bright. So yeah, Paul G. Solar mass units. Maybe I do have the Rona. <laughs> Okay, falling apart here. So he did um, 200. I can't do upside. Wow, I'm dumb today. 200 
shift cube divide by 300 fudge what's going on 200 shift cube divide by 300 equals then you do shift square root and then you multiply it times 18 backwards sorry my calculator is fading and that's how you get the 2939 i bet that was probably difficult for you guys to see um it's solar mass units what's the problem with that as a mass of a star what does this mean Clark? like huh past i forget what it's called but it's like past the maximum mass the of a star it's past the eddington luminosity right or the eddington limit so in other words this is wait a minute it's too massive to be a single star so what does that imply christopher there's two of them multiple stars multiple stars in fact what must happen is the cloud must go through a set of fragmentation where pockets of this cloud begin to collapse on top of each other and then instead of forming one star you form a whole clump of stars and guess what that becomes that becomes this that's how these things form a cl these all came from the same collapsing cloud, then they subfragment and they become an open cluster. The result is a star cluster. You could probably make 29 O stars, which would be about right for an open cluster. Hey, Professor. Yeah. So the pillar like in the future is going to be like just a couple of stars. Oh, oh, oh. So let me explain something to you, Arunsak. That the pillars of creation. No. The thing that actually forms a star in the pillars of creation, where are they? Is a little sub pocket buried deep, deep inside there. Do you see this entire structure? This thing is probably a hundred light years tall. If you could crush all of this gas down into stars, you'd probably be able to make 10,000 to 100,000 suns from it. So all of that gas is not going to crush down because not enough of this gas will have enough gravitational attraction to do it. But what does happen is under certain conditions, small dense cores buried inside here they will collapse to form a star. And you probably won't even be able to see the star because it'll be buried in so much gas and dust at first. Later on, they shine their way out of the cloud like chickens coming out of an egg. So that was a, that's a cool question. All right, that covers our third question. And the nice thing is that's the same formula we're going to use for the next question, 56. So we're moving right along and we're making very good time class. I'm erasing. Okay, Runsack, you want to try one now? Yeah, I can do it. Okay. 56. The title is Internal Temperature of Sun. Let me know Sorry, what what's the title? Internal Temperature of the Sun. Oh, wow. You ready? Yeah. The sun is essentially a gas cloud in which the forces of pressure and gravity balance each other. We can therefore use the equation in mathematic, mathematical insight 16.1 to estimate the interior, interior temperature of the sun from its mass and particle density. And then uh, part A is what is the average number density of particles within the sun, given that the average mass per particle is about 10 to the negative 24 grams. Um, I had to write the Jean's mass equation again. And remember, we're gonna talk about a, 
a star that's squeezing itself and is in hydrostatic equilibrium like our own sun. Uh, can you read part A all over again, Aransak? Because I kind of missed it. Yeah. Um, what is the average number density of particles within the sun, given that the average mass per particle is about 10 to the negative 24 grams? And there's 10 a hint. 10 to the negative 24 grams? Yep, 10 to the negative 24 gram. All right. G. So they're giving us the mass of a hydrogen atom in grams. Remember that number density are the particles per cubic centimeter. So one way that I would do this, well, there's a couple of different ways to skin this cat, is to figure out how many particles are in the sun and then divide it by the volume of the sun. That's the first way that comes to my mind. Now we know what the mass of the sun is. The mass of the sun is two times 10 to the 30 kilograms. Do you guys know how many grams that would be? Two times 10 to the 33. Excellent, Christopher. Christopher, since you're so smart, we're just going to write that down. I am not smart. Please don't say I'm smart. While, while no. you're, you're doing this, just right. Now what we want to do is let's find the N, which is the total number of atoms in the sun. That'll be kind of fun. Do you guys know how to use this? to find the total number of atoms in the sun? Would you like divide the mass of the sun by the mass of the individual particle. hydrogen? Yeah. I, okay. So it seems like you're doing a pretty good job of being smart today, me, son. So the number of atoms is the mass of the sun over the mass of the individual particles, or two times 10 to the 33 grams divided by 10 to the minus 24 grams. You can do that in your head, right, Christopher? Just what's 33 plus 24? <laughs> well, what's my power of 10, kids? Come on, someone play with me here. 57. Thank you. And that's 10 to the 57 atoms. Now I'm thinking if we want to find the number density, we should divide that by the volume of the sun in cubic centimeters. So uh, the radius of the sun is 700,000 kilometers which is seven times 10 to the eight meters. I'm skipping the dimensional analysis because I think you guys are capable of that. Add two more zeros to get to centimeters, seven times 10 to the 10 centimeters. The volume of the, the volume of a sphere is four thirds pi r cubed. So for the volume of the sun, well, why don't you guys calculate that and tell me what you get. One point four times ten to the thirty three. Should we wait? I got thirty two. Let me try that again. I got thirty three as well. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I forgot to hit equals. That was dumb. Wow. Rookie move right there. 1.4 times 10. What are my units? Uh, 
uh, centimeters cubed. Okay. Now up at the top, I'm going to calculate the number density. I'll erase my givens. So the number density is the number of atoms divided by the volume of the sun, which is 2 times 10 to the 57 doodahs divided by 1.4 times 10 to the 33. What do you get for number density, guys? One point four times ten to the twenty four units particles per centimeter squared cubed cube whatever like I said dumb as a rock after ten minutes okay that's that's the answer to part A if you can believe that guys. I wonder how that compares to the number density of air. That's a number I always forget to memorize, but we should. Um, number density of air. So 2 times 10, so that's 0 0.02 times 10 to the 21, 10 to the 20th, 10 to the 19th. So it's two times 10 to the 19th cubic centimeters. The sun is a bit denser than that. Okay, I need to erase this so I can have room for part B. Our run sec needs a second. I'm good. All right. Anyone else object? I can't believe I broke that light bulb today. That sucked. All right. I forgot this was kind of a gnarly problem. OK, Runsack, what's part B? Righty. Um, what is the approximate temperature necessary for gas pressure to balance gravity within the sun? given the average particle density from part A. Sorry, this is the mass. OK. So we have the mass of the sun. And we know that it's got enough mass to contract the sun into a, the gas into a star. And there's some kind of pressure balance here. So we're going to use the genes mass because the genes mass is a condition of gravity pressure balance. Since we're dealing with our sun, the mass is one solar mass, which should be equal to 18 solar masses times the square root of the temperature divided by the number density, which is known but we'll leave it there for now. Notice the mass of the sun cancels out on both sides and I get 118 squared, one over 18 squared is equal to T cubed divided by N. So I divided by 18 and I squared both sides. And then I get T will be equal to Well, 1 over 18 squared is just 1 over 18 squared. So I get n over 18 squared. Ah, but this is t cubed, right? Thus, t will equal the cube root of n over 18 squared. 
So, can you guys remind me what the number density was? 1.4 times 10 to the 33. Punch it up. What you get? I got 1.63 times 10 to the 10. Watch how I modify. I'm going to write that in a slightly different way, run sec. Instead of writing it as 1.6 times 10 to the 10, I'm going to write 16 times 10 to the 9. What are my units? Kelvin. And I'd like to point out that that temperature is not random. Why? Why is that an interesting result? And I'm talking to Kevin, I think, or someone who was in the background earlier who knew a special number. Why is it not random? That's the temperature required for fusion. Exactly. Just by assuming the gravity of the star has to balance thermal pressure, you automatically get just over the limit for fusion, proving that stars can sustain fusion just by balancing gravity and temperature. There's a part C to this problem, Arunsak. Why don't you read it for us? All right. Um... C, how does your estimate compare with the internal core temperature of the sun? This is just over the 15 million Kelvin temperature required for fusion. That's the question I want to answer anyways. Write that down and then we're done with that problem. We got one more to go. Um, did everyone read? Emily, you want to take us out for the last one? Sure. Thanks. You can hear them birds one more time. Hey guys, wait, before Emily reads, can I erase all this junk? This last one should be a cinch, I think. I've never solved it before. I'm kind of looking forward to it. Chapter 16, 59. What's the title? Mass of a Brown Dwarf. Uh, first of all, you guys remember what the brown dwarfs are, right? What's a brown dwarf? Uh, it's the big boy, and it's not that bright. It's not a big boy. It's it's a star that does not have enough mass for fusion, right? It's bigger than Jupiter, but smaller than the sun. Okay, Emily, take us out. Uh, suppose you observe a binary, binary system containing a main sequence star and a brown dwarf. The orbital period of the system is one year, and the average separation of the system is one AU. Then you measure the Doppler shifts of the spectral lines from the main sequence star and the brown dwarf, finding that the orbital speed of the brown dwarf in the system is 20 times that of the main sequence star. How massive is the brown dwarf? Okay, so let me just make sure I get this right. They said the velocity of the brown dwarf is 20 times that of the main sequence star? Guys, this should be a wicked, wicked, wicked easy problem. 
what do I do? The first part should be easy anyways. Huh. I thought you guys might know what to do. Well, what's it asking again? They want to find the mass of the brown dwarf. I've got a main sequence star being orbited by a brown dwarf. Are we going to use the uh, NK3 Kitty Edition? The Kitty Edition. Wait, who is that? Is that Paul? Yep. Paul, that's awesome. And, and the Kitty Edition is going to be wicked simple here, isn't it? This is one of the reasons I selected this problem is to do us all a big favor. Because Paul, if the total mass of the system, the mass of the main sequence plus the mass of the brown dwarf is A cubed over P squared, we've already got the right units here. So it's one AU cubed over one year squared. And what does that give us? One. Yeah. One what? One solar mass. Yeah. One total mass, total solar mass. Yes. Um, here's what's tricky about this problem. We know that the total mass is one solar mass. But now we're supposed to somehow figure out what the individual stars are. You guys may not remember this because you were probably feeling nauseous. But during our lab last week, we had the exact same problem. One of the rules for binary stars goes like this. The ratio of the masses is the inverse ratio of their velocities. And let me see if I can have that make sense just by showing you an animated GIF from today. Remember at the end of class today, I showed you some stuff with binary stars. And I was showing you these two stars, ow, oh, fudge, f function f5, 82, or 80. Here's an orbit with two binary stars, but I was trying to show you something about the velocities by showing you these Doppler shifted lines. And I want you to look at this big fat blue star and this little wimpy red star. If you are the little star, your velocity is gonna be faster because you're, you're kind of getting whipped around faster. The more massive star is a bit more sluggish. And in general, the way it works is if the blue star is two times the mass of the red star, then the blue star will move half as fast around its circular orbit. Does that make any sense? You can actually kind of see it in the Doppler shifts. Notice that in this picture here, the little star is getting these really long Doppler shifts indicating a fast velocity, whereas the big fat star is creating these tiny little Doppler shifts indicating a slow velocity. In other words, we can argue that if the velocity of the brown dwarf divided by the velocity of the main sequence star is a factor of 20, the inverse should be true about their masses. The mass of the main sequence star should be 20 times the mass of the brown dwarf. That is a fundamental result from binary stars. We use it all the time in astronomy. The ratio of the masses is the inverse ratio, ratio of the velocities. With that in mind, I think we can pull a little two equations, two unknowns kind of magic, because I can then argue that the mass of my main sequence star is 20 times the mass of the brown dwarf. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jam the mass of the main sequence star. I'm gonna substitute it for that, for the mass of the brown dwarf. And I will get, 
20 times the mass of the brown dwarf plus one times the mass of the brown dwarf is equal to one solar mass or the mass of the brown dwarf um, 20, mm, I shouldn't do this too quickly for you guys, which is also equal to 21 times the mass of the brown dwarf because 20 plus one. Therefore, the mass of the brown dwarf is 1 21th a solar mass. What was the lower limit for the mass of a star? One tenth the mass of a star uh, of the sun. So this brown dwarf is half the minimum mass of a star. Sweetness. We're done. I love that problem. I'm going to assign that now every year. That was wicked fast. All right. Well, I've got some glass chips to vacuum. Okay. Uh, before I end the recording and the class, <laughs> um, we have discovered during the course of our homework session today that there is no class on Tuesday, right? So I'm going to miss you guys. I won't see you for a whole week, all right? I don't know what you're going to do with yourself without astronomy class. I'm sure it's going to be difficult. Cry, yes. <laughs> uh, Blair, can you see this? All right. All right, guys. Um, uh, live long and prosper. And don't forget to rock the vote, OK? Don't forget to participate in democracy. And uh, I don't know, keep the faith. I'll see you guys. Bye.